My name is Rosie. I'm the events coordinator here at Raiders. Um, we're just so happy to be able to do this kind of thing again. Um, so what I get to do, which is, is very easy, is introduce Andy. Um, Bookstore has been here for 30 years. It was Ada's first job. And the thing about Raiders is that it's always been about community. And even when the community gets really big and our hometown favorite poets get really, really big, we're still here for each other, and I really, I love that. So if everyone can give Andy a round of applause, he'll introduce Ada. You, you don't have to applaud me, really. It's, it's not, not necessary. Um, well, it's fabulous to see so many people. Um, uh, it's, it's been years, I mean, really years. So, uh, um, so I was going to uh, repeat an old story that uh, I've told many times before, or to, well, to some audiences, uh, because it has a, a different point to it this time. Um, when I was uh, going off to college, I, I, my father asked me what I was going to major in, and I said, I want to, I want to study poetry. And it, that didn't please him very much. Uh, he, he was a, you know, a child of the Great Depression, and he wanted me to get a job as, a, as an accountant or a, a lawyer or a proctologist, anything um, that, that had a paycheck to it. And, uh, and uh, so, but he was convinced that he could pay for it, so he did. And I went off to school, and uh, midway through my senior year, I had this epiphany, and uh, I called him up from Albuquerque, and I said, Dad, I realize I'm never going to make a living as a, as a poet anymore. Uh, you know, I, I, it's, it's not smart. I'm, I want to do something more commercial. I want to be practical. And he said, great, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to write novels. <laughs> and there was a long silence on the phone between Albuquerque and Pasadena. Um, but, uh, and he wasn't happy with that either, of course. And, uh, and uh, it turns out uh, my dad was right. Uh, you know, he, and nobody, almost nobody makes, makes a career out of being a poet. Nobody. It's just, it's unheard of. And uh, especially in, in America. Um, I can count three people that I know who've, who've done that. Uh, one is Gary Snyder. Uh, the other is Amanda Gorman, I think. I'm just guessing. And, uh, and the third is Ada Lamont, uh, who's, actually, who's actually defying all the odds, I think. Uh, um, so Ada you know, is the author of six books of poetry, uh, including The Carrying, and she's won the National Book Circle Award for poetry. She did Bright Dad's Things. She, uh, she, uh, she was, she had the Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award. Uh, she got a Guggenheim Fellowship. Who gets that, you know? And um, and she's her her stuff has been in the New Yorker and uh, all kinds of places. Um, it's it's just it's just amazing. Um, and uh, we've known her for 30 years. And uh, I won't go into all of that because that's a long story. But um, even you know, even as a teenager, she was always swinging for the fences. I thought she was she was always she was always full of surprises, and and uh, she was always a star. And uh, and she continues to be a star. And and this this new book is is just the latest home run that that that's going on. And um, personally, between you and me, I'm. I'm waiting for the next iteration of this. I, I'm thinking that when Joe Biden wins the presidency in 2024, I fully expect to see her up on the dais there <laughs> delivering the inaugural poem. Um, I, I, I would be surprised if she's not. Um, it's time. So, so won't you please welcome Ada Limone back to Sonoma. Thank you. in the front row you don't know who's here it's such a it's such a gift to see all your faces um thank you for being here um andy thank you for that beautiful introduction um i was just telling him a story about when i first worked at the bookstore when it was across the street 
we would get the big shipments of book in, books in from Ingram, and um, my job was to call his father and his mother, Arthur and Lucy, and say, the eagle has landed. <laughs> and then they would come and unpack the books. And it was, uh, it was beautiful. I loved them, and I miss them all the time. And it, is, it really is a community here, and it, um, it's one that I am very, very grateful to be a part of. Um, I was also just telling uh, my friend Debbie Emery that the thing about reading here in this particular space is that I can't pretend to be anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, y'all know me. Um, so I thought I would read um, eight poems, and then we would just do some questions from the audience, and then we'll find some books. Um, I think this book is really important to me, and I think partly is because this is my first book that feels a little bit less about me, even though I'm in it. Um, it feels to me a little bit like an offering. Um, and so this is a poem called A Good Story, and it's from my stepfather. A Good Story. Some days, dishes piled in the sink, books littering the coffee table, are harder than others. Today, my head is packed with cockroaches, dizziness, and everywhere it hurts. Venom in the jaw, behind the eyes, between the blades. Still, the dog is snoring on my right, the cat on my left. Outside, all those red buds are just getting good. I tell a friend the body is so body, and she nods. I used to like the darkest stories, the bleak snippets someone would toss out about just how bad it could get. My stepfather told me a story about when he lived on the streets as a kid, how he'd some nights sleep under the grill at a fast food restaurant until both he and his buddy got fired. I used to like that story for some reason. Something in me that believed in overcoming. But right now, all I want is a story about human kindness. The way once, when I couldn't stop crying because I was 15 and heartbroken, he came in and made me eat a small pizza he'd cut up into tiny bites until the tears stopped. Maybe I was just hungry, I said, and he nodded, holding out the last piece. <laughs> and uh, most of you know that my mother is an amazing artist and is um, is the painter that has painted the covers of all six of my books. Mm. And um, she's here tonight, and this is a, a poem for her. The First Lesson. She took the hawk wing and spread it, slightly from the shoulder down from the bend of the wing to the lesser coverts, from the primary coverts to the tertials to the carpal edge. The bird was dead to begin with found splayed over the white line of Arnold Drive. She was not scared of death. She took the bird in like a stray thing that needed warmth and water. She pulled it apart to see how it worked. My mother nailed the wing to her studio wall. She told me not to be scared. I watched and learned to watch closely the world. Um, this is a poem uh, about praising folks in your life, um, but I also sort of really believe that there's many times that we write poems. Poets have whole books of poems dedicated to real lousy ex-boyfriends. <laughs> and I see it all the time. I'm like, that person does not deserve a whole book. <laughs> so of course it's about friendship for me, but it's also about um, a bird. The Magnificent Frigate Bird. Is it okay to begin with the obvious? I am full of stones. Is it okay not to look out this window, but look out another? A mentor once said, you can't start a poem with a man looking out a window. Too many men looking out a window. What about a woman? Today is a haunting, 
One last orange on the counter, it is a dead fruit. We swallow dead things. Once in Rio near Leblon, large seabirds soared over the vast South Atlantic Ocean. I had never seen them before. Eight foot wingspan and gigantic in their confident gliding, black with a red neck like a wound or a hidden treasure or both. When I looked it up, I learned it was a magnificent frigate bird. It sounded like that enormity of a bird had named itself. What a pleasure to say, I am magnificent. And two, they traveled as a team, so I wondered if they named each other, generously tapping one another's deeply forked tail or their plumage glistening with salt air, their guller sacks saying, you are magnificent. You are also magnificent. It makes me want to give all my loves the adjectives they deserve. You are resplendent. You are radiant. You are sublime. I am far away from tropical waters. I have no skill for flight or wings to skim the waves effortlessly like the wind itself. But from here, I can still imagine rapture, a glorious caught fish in the mouth of a bird. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, it's, it's, a, it's a strange poem, but it's based on a true story. And uh, my best friend growing up is here, Sarah. And um, we actually did this to her poor father. We, we left this jar on the floor. And so <coughs> this is a poem about that. But of course, it's about many other things. Jar of Scorpions. <laughs> Translucent and slithering against the beige carpet, like a dozen fugitive ideas shoved to the back of the brain's border, the ideas about hurting yourself or hurting others, they came into view, the filaments of nightmares, the stinging slop suckers, the venomous miscreants, two pedipals grasping for prey already in the first hours of their birth. How strange to think that nearly 30 years later, I see those nascent scorpions as clear as today's dead moth stuck in the screen's small squares. We did what children do with tiny and terrible things. We trapped them so we could see more closely, intimately investigate their particular evil doing behind the thick clear glass of the mason jar. We watched how they crawled, stingers ready, on top of one another, circling. Our discovery felt awful, like unearthing mortality. We were two girls then, and despite our restless fear, we could not bring ourselves to kill them. We grew almost fond of the way they scurried against the glass, the way they became almost ours, minuscule marauders, all things of the night captured in the light's unforgiving reveal. We do not know what happened to them. We left the scorplings in the middle of the floor, in the glass with a sign that said simply, jar of scorpions. <laughs> this is where it ends or begins. What do you want for them? From here, we can make it up. <laughs> Um, I'm sure Mark's like, I can tell you what happened to those scorpions. <laughs> uh, I grew up in the apartment right there, and um, going back and forth, and this is a poem um, that I wrote, it really sort of pushing against sort of uh, the ideas that other people have about what a family is. And um, the first line came to me, and then the rest of the poem came. Joint custody. Why did I never see it for what it was? Abundance. Two families, two different kitchen tables, two sets of rules, two creeks, two highways, two step-parents with their fish tanks 
at eight tracks or cigarette smoke or expertise in recipes or reading skills. I cannot reverse it. The record scratched and stopping to that original chaotic track. But let me say, I was taken back and forth on Sundays and it was not easy, but I was loved each place. And so I have two brains now, two entirely different brains. The one that always misses where I'm not, and the one that is so relieved to finally be home. Mm. It's so interesting to read poems like that's where that poem (laughs) existed. Um, That's a gift, really. Um, This is a poem that I wrote for my... um, my uh, grandfather, my paternal grandfather, called Heart on Fire. As a foster child, my grandfather learned not to get in trouble. Mexican and motherless, dead as she was from tuberculosis, he practiced words in a new language and kept his slender head down. When the other boys begged him to slip into the music shop's upper window to steal harmonicas for each of them, music being important, thievery being secondary, he refused. When the cops came, they could easily spot the boys who robbed the music store to find the ones spitting broken notes into the air, joyously mouthing the stainless steel, mimicking men on street corners busking for coins. But not my grandfather. He knew not to risk it all for one stolen moment of exaltation. It's easy to imagine this is who I come from, a line of serious men who follow the rules. But might I add that later he was a dancer, a singer, an actor whose best roles ended up on the cutting room floor, a cut up, a ham who liked a good story who would have told you life was a series of warnings, but also magic. Once he was sent for a box of matches and he put that box of strike anywheres in the pocket of his Madras shirt and ran home. He ran so fast to be on time, to be good. And when he did so, the whole box ignited. So he was a boy (laughs) running down the canyon road with what looked like a heart on fire. He'd laugh when he'd tell you this. A heart on fire, he'd say, so you'd remember. (laughs) And this is a a poem from my father, um, who sent me this amazing black and white photo of him in the 70s. and he's, he's just recovering from hip surgery, so we'll give him some love and light. My father's mustache. Let us pause to applaud the white bell-bottom suit, <laughs> the wide flared collar, the black thick coiffed hair. In this photo of my father, he sent to himself at a gathering off Sonoma Highway in the early 70s. I can't stop looking at the photo. There is a swagger that feels almost otherworldly, epic, like Lorca expounding in Buenos Aires, not the form, but the marrow of form. He's perfect there, my father in the photo. I feel somehow as if I'm perched on a bay laurel, nearby, though born, though not born yet. It's in black and white, the photo. You can see his grin, behind his lush mustache. Is it time that moves in me now, a sense of ache and unraveling? My father in his pristine white suit, the eye of the world barely able to handle his smooth, unbroken stride. It's been a year since I've seen him in person. I miss how he points to his apple trees and I miss his smooth face that no longer has the mustache I always adored. As a child, I once cried when he shaved it. Even then, I was too attached to this life. This is 
a poem I wrote for my husband. Against Nostalgia. If I had known back then you were coming, when I first thought love could be the thing to save me after all, if I had known, would I have still glued myself to the back of his motorcycle while we flew across the starless bridge over the East River to where I grew my first garden behind the wire fencing and the concrete raised beds lined by ruby twilight roses? If I had known it would be you, who even then I like to look at across a room, always listening rigorously, a self-questioning look, the way your mouth was always your mouth. Would I have climbed back on that bike again and again until even I was sick with fumes and the sticky seat too hot in the early fall? If I had known, would I have still made mistake after mistake? until I had only the trunk of me left, stripped and nearly bare of leaves. If I had known, the truth is, I would have kneeled and said, sooner, come to me sooner. Wow. 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 I will, this is a poem, I'll close with this poem, um, that is a poem I wrote when um, I, poetry sort of forsake me. I, I felt like I was really early in the pandemic, and um, you know, people were calling and saying, like, "Do you have any comment about the power of poetry?" And I was like, mm, "It seems like you should be talking to a scientist, or like." inventing a vaccine. <laughs> I was like, I think poetry is really important, but right now, um, I was, so I was finding that sort of giving up, um, it was hard, I was trying to read, I was trying to write, and um, like many of you, I was sort of really um, ensconced in my own fear and anxiety, and so I think I was, had thought, well, I guess I'll never write a poem again. <laughs> And I went through the list of poems that I wanted to write and the subjects. And then what happened was that, of course, what does a poet do when they give up on poetry is they write a poem about it. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, in, in, in so many ways, I think this poem actually, even though it's the last poem in the book, started me writing again. The End of Poetry. Enough of Osseus and Chickadee and sunflower and snowshoes, maple and seeds, samara and shoot. Enough Cuscuro, enough of thus and prophecy, and the stoic farmer and faith in our father and tis of thee. Enough of bosom and bud, skin and God not forgetting, and star bodies and frozen birds. Enough of the will to go on or not go on, or how a certain light does a certain thing. Enough of the kneeling and the rising and the looking inward and the looking up. Enough of the gun the drama, the acquaintance's suicide, the long lost letter on the dresser, enough of the longing and the ego and the obliteration of ego, enough of the mother and the child and the father and the child, and enough of the pointing to the world, weary and desperate, enough of the brutal and the border, enough of can you see me, can you hear me, enough I am human, enough I am alone and I am desperate, enough of the animal saving me, enough of the high water, enough sorrow, enough of the air and its ease. I am asking you to touch me. Thank you. happy to answer questions. If you want to say them, I can maybe try to repeat them or include them in my answer so that people can hear them in the microphone. Yeah. I've always loved to play with form, and I think for me, um, it's always about breath and rhythm, um, so that when I'm putting a stanza break in, we, it is that awareness of that we're stopping, that there's some sort of pause. Um, and, and then if it's meant to connect, right, that it's all one stanza with no stanza breaks, then 
what we're doing there is that I'm saying it's all connected, that I believe that the rhythm and the thought process, everything, the unraveling of it is all connected. Um, so for me, I'm very intentional about my line breaks and about my form. Um, and I've often thought that sometimes we put stanza breaks in poems because that we think it make, makes it look like a poem, um, which is fine. But if I'm going to put a stanza break in, I really want to be very clear of what that stanza break is doing. Um, and so many times I think, actually, my mind is, is working in a way that's connecting all of these things at once, and I need to honor that that's how the poem was made. Um, and so the stanza breaks won't go in there. So it's a mix. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? That's a great question. So the, the um, poets that I look back to and, and look to for support and when I need um, that poetic nourishment, um, it, it changes usually on what I need and what you know what I'm drawn to. Like many of you, it's like sometimes you're like, oh, I want to read this book. And you're like, no, not right now. I'm going to go here. That's just how literature works, which I love. Um, and I'll say that um, for me, I found a lot of solace, um, especially during the pandemic, in um, the Lucille Clifton Collected, um, also Audre Lorde. Um, and then there's this wonderful poet who is from um, um, Buenos Aires, and her name is Alejandra Pijarnik, and she's translated by Yvette Sigurd, and fantastic work, and she really pays attention to silence. And I think during the pandemic, it was so interesting to read poems that were honoring silence and a failure of language. Um, and so uh, those were probably the three books I kept turning to. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, the question was, um, if it was a, a poet of my stature, I'm 5'2", um, uh, has a... <laughs> my mom just said, no, you're not. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little under 5'2". Um, uh, if, if, if I find it hard to stay authentic and to write things that you know really matter with sort of the expectations out there of you know um, a larger audience, and um, yeah, I think I do, and I think one of the things that has really been important to me is to write poems for the people that I love, and I think that's been a huge way of staying connected to the real Ada which is to make offerings, right? To be like, oh, this is a poem I'm going to write for my stepfather, and then I'm going to send it to him, right? I'm going to send it to him. I'm not going to send it to the New Yorker, you know? And this is like a, what the act of real connection and real communication does. And I feel like any time you kind of get into a place where the audience or the readers are doing more work in your mind than the actual poem, it's really problematic. So um, many times I will write poems where I... I, I just pretend no one will ever read it. And I will say, okay, I'm just, just write what you want and no one will ever read this. And then maybe a year later, I say, you know what, this is okay, I can send it out. But I really have to protect myself from that way. And and um, I think it's an important thing to do because I, I, I'd really like to be an artist for a very long time. <laughs> and I would like to be, you know, 100 years old writing poems. And I don't want to burn out in that way that I see, you know, some artists doing when they're not feeling like they're nourishing themselves. And so I think first and foremost, the poems that I write need to heal and help me. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so the question was whether or not the early success um, has kind of helped me relax in a way so that I'm not somehow sort of competing with myself or my own work. Um, and I feel like that's a, another important question and I feel like right after um, Bright Dead Things was nominated for the National Book Award in 2015, I did have a moment of, oh, I can never write another book because this hit, right? People love this book. And so I was like, my instinct was to stop, which I thought was so fascinating. Like, what is that about an artist that's like, well, people love that. I'm done. <laughs> you know? And then it's like, but I didn't write those poems for them. I wrote everything I've ever written for me. It's true, and that book helped me be a, the human I am, and ev each book will do that. Um, and so I have to return to that and the instinct, the real power and purpose of poetry for myself. And uh, I don't mean that in a selfish way, but in the way of um, staying true to the impulse of it versus the um, outward 
over societal constraints that may be or pressure that may come with any kind of success yeah absolutely yeah thank you yeah so that question was about um, the transition um, from growing up in Sonoma of course and now living in Kentucky and what that kind of landscape does for me now um, and I feel like it's really fascinating because and I can't remember who said this but it's a wonderful quote and I have to look it up I feel like it was like Grace Paley or someone wonderful said like the, the, the best writing advice she could ever give was low overhead <laughs> and I, there is something to be said for being able to nourish yourself, feed yourself, close yourself, and actually do all the things that you need to do for yourself and write. And before I moved to Kentucky, I was living full-time in New York. And it was a really incredible, amazing time in my life. And I never felt like I had enough money in the bank for anything. And I was always scrambling, you know, even with a good job and even with a nice, you know, place that I lived and it was just like I felt like I could never get ahead of myself and Kentucky offered me um, many things but the most important for me as a writer was time and space and I was allowed to sit back and breathe and just have a little more time and space and it helped that the rent was really low and it helped that you know there was a there's a level of um, real natural beauty there that I found stunning as well um, so the transition wasn't so much from here to there, it was more like out of New York City to Kentucky, which is different. But um, but I will say this, that Sonoma always feels like home, and coming here always feels like home, and there's a reason it's it's so much in my work, you know? Um, and it's interesting, because I think Kentucky and Sonoma have played a big part, their landscapes and their, in their natural environments have shown up in my work a lot, um, which makes me happy. Yeah. Thank you. So the question was, I mentioned nourishing myself as an artist, and then what are the other things that I do um, to help myself remain nourished? And I will say, I am a huge advocate of naps. <laughs> um, I took a nap today. I took a nap yesterday. Um, so I feel like uh, there's a lot to shutting down, and I don't think we do that enough, and I don't think we allow ourselves silence enough. Um, and I was just listening to this wonderful podcast about, like, um, it was Lama Rod Owens that was talking about that the goal is longevity, right? That we should we should try to shoot for that, like, to be around as long as we can. And I really believe that. I think I try to keep that in mind, even when things are sort of operating, like, oh, we have to go 110%, you know? I was like, yeah, but some days, let's take it down to 70%, you know? I'm available 70%. And I think, um, I think being really aware of that, um, setting boundaries, I think the pandemic has really helped probably many of us say no to things um, and set boundaries and, and, and allow yourself to say, like, actually that doesn't work for me and, and that's okay. And I'm not gonna hold on to the guilt that comes along with that. Um, and the other things are to take breaks from writing. I think that um, anytime we center one thing in your life as the most important thing, I don't know about that, you know? I feel like it's like, yeah, I love to write poems, but I also love to like go have a cocktail with my best friend, you know? I love to like laugh on the couch with my dog and my husband and watch a show. And I think it's really about having a whole life and never making one thing everything, for me at least. Yeah. Um, the question was how I got involved in poetry. Um, I mean, I think that I, I was, I always really loved it. And it's funny because I could answer this question in a million ways because I can see, it's like that sort of the threads where you're like, oh yeah, it, could, it was that and some of that and some of that and some of that. Um, I know music and liner notes was really important to me as a kid, like going, like sitting on the front of the record player and going through, you know, Ricky Lee Jones, Chucky's in Love and being like, whoa, this is amazing. And, you know, every, looking at every single lyric, the same with Joan Armitrady. Um, and I feel like there was a lot of that uh, in my life. So that was, but then after that, I really fell in love with poetry around 15. Um, it was actually a, on a test in Mrs. Lale's class at the, at, almost at the University of Sonoma. <laughs> Sonoma Valley High. Um, there was a, there was one art by Elizabeth Bishop and uh, I remember we were reading it and discussing it, and I just kept having the answers. And it was just for me, it was just like, can we, can you talk about what's different in this? And I was like, yes, 
and and I really got it. Like I was like just got it. It made total sense to me. And I remember afterwards I came up and I said, Can I have a copy of my test? <laughs> because I wanted the poem, because the poem was on the test. Um, but then also just even growing up in the bookstore, you know, I was fifteen when I got my first job here and I am, um, you know, they would joke that my favorite uh, uh, shelf to dust was the oh, the poetry shelves because I could take them off and then kind of read them and reorganize them. Um, but you know, there was a there was a lot of poetry in my life and I was lucky for that. There were people um, you know, like Earl Leclerc who was a local poet who was doing marvelous readings and you know and reading with my stepdad who was a fiction writer at the time and all of these things and so I was able to be a part of that community and. I was lucky in that way because I, I don't think everyone grew up grew up with poetry. But for me, it wasn't distant from my life. It wasn't something like, oh, what is this strange thing? It, it felt very much part of the community. Yeah. Um, the question is about um, where poetry ends and sort of short fiction or flash fiction begins, and whether or not that's a blurred line or if it's a hard line for me. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, and my question, or my answer to that, or my question to that, is. Um, that I have found for me that the instinct is always leaning more towards sound with poetry. Um, and that as soon as you go towards more sense and story, then you're leaning a, a little bit more into the fiction world. But it's, if you've got that sound and the sound is driving you, even if sense and story is there, the sound is going to win out, then it's poetry. Yeah, thank you. So the question was about the role of nature in my poetry, and um, I've always felt that, I, I mean, I think I've always been that kid who's like looking out the window, <laughs> you know, on a very basic level, like, oh, you know, and my, everything in, in elementary school on, my favorite, my favorite subjects were, um, like when we would learn about trees or plants, I still think about Mr. Mike, you know, <coughs> Mike Wachowski, and we would just, we studied like, sea animals like for a whole like it was all of first grade and it was the best time I'm always like and even now I'll say oh sea sponges are amazing you know I learned all about them in first grade um but I think there was a level in which like that kind of paying attention and that looking always felt like a way of um I mean not to sound cheesy but it's a way of loving like it's a way of you know really looking at something is it's a way of loving and I think that when I find myself spinning off um, which I'm sure many of us are doing now, have been doing, it's a continual spin. Um, I find that that deep looking and that getting small and that really focusing my attention on something in nature that seems to make some kind of beautiful sense um, is a way to ground myself and remind myself that I'm connected to all of that. And then maybe somehow there's a beautiful sense in me too. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, um, Elizabeth Bishop, uh, he was saying, is, was, ha was known for um, having a penchant for revision, which is very true, and asking about my revision process. Um, Elizabeth Bishop is famous for when her collected came out, not like a, just a you know, book of poems, but when her collected came out, she would sign her name in the book at the book line and make two corrections <laughs> into her poem, The Moose, which she famously, I think, what took her like, you know, it was like 12 years to write or something like that. Um, and so I'll say that there's two ways that I revise, and one of which is I, I, I do a lot of revising on the page as I go. Um, I compose a lot out loud. Um, and so usually by the time it's finished, I've read the thing a hundred times, truly. Um, and so by the time I feel like it's a draft of something, I've really read it a lot. Um, so it's that oral quality. It goes back to the sound. It goes back to that, like how the breath is working. Um, and then the second thing is that I send them to my stepfather, who's one of my very first readers. And, um, you know, he will often sort of nudge in ways that I'm sort of surprised by. And I think sometimes you want someone that, as a first reader, has your same aesthetics, and I think we do, but I think more than anything, he knows my aesthetic. And I think he's very willing to kind of push me in a direction that's like, no, I think this is what you, you were doing. And I was like, oh, right, that is what I'm doing. Um, so I think having first readers that will do that um, is really a beautiful thing. I think sometimes we have a myth of like the individual artist 
always doing all things like on their own and we work in community you know we send things to each other we send things to our friends we send things i mean my husband has listened to a million poems and been like oh just listen to this you know and it, of course all i want him to say is like it's brilliant and sometimes he'll be like oh and i'm like oh no i read it too i read it too soon it's not ready i'm going back to my room um so there's you know there's a lot of that kind of um that we, we're not alone, that we're not, like, it's not a singular person that does everything. It's, it is in community, and, and other people help us along the way. Well, thank you so much for being here. Um, it's been such an honor, and um, it's just so beautiful to be in this space. And I know for a long time I was like, am I ever going to be back there? I kept dreaming about this apartment, dreaming about, like, all of these things, and it's just, um, it feels like a gift to be here. So thank you for being a part of this night. Thank you.